Good morning, Dr. Hala. On a different uh, note, <laughs> I've sent you an email yesterday with regards to another event. Can you get okay. back? Okay. Can you get back to me today if you can? Uh, uh, I didn't see another email. Ah, regarding the Monday event? The uh, uh, British Embassy event, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, already we decided that I'm on it. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it's okay the timing, yeah, to book your timing to let the... As long as they book it in the clinic, of course, I don't mind. Okay, do you want me to share your, your uh, timings with them or would you would you do it? With the yeah, call center. It with Mr. Suhail, and maybe yeah. he can just block the schedule for then. All right, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we can let people in now, Jihan. What do you say? Yeah, I think we can. Anita, can we let them in? Yes. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to another exciting CME organized by United Eastern Medical Services, Health Plus Clinics, the Anatta Lemurat Hospital, and Moorfields Eye Hospital, Abu Dhabi. I'm Dr. Neha, and I'm going to um, introduce you to our speaker today, Dr. Hala, in a bit. Uh, while we are waiting for everybody else to join and for Dr. Hala to start, just a few, um, uh, sorry, just a few things about the CME and how it's done. So we will be posting some links in the chat box throughout the CME. In the initial part, before we start, there will be a link about a free lecture assessment. This is uh, just a few questions which will take less than a minute for you to answer online. So you could do this while we are waiting. And uh, then a similar link will be posted for a post lecture assessment, as well as an evaluation form, as well as an evaluation form for uh, the um, you know, feedback about the CME, how it was done, and if you have any suggestions on improvement. These are all mandatory for us to be able to submit to, to DOH and for you to get a certificate from DOH. As you all know, uh, we are accredited by DOH, so the certificate is being given by DOH itself and not directly by us. Uh, we will be sent uh, an email with instructions and a link to the TAM website where you will be able to apply for the CME. And as soon as we get that application, we will try to approve and you will get your CME from DOH uh, and not from us. Even if we give you a CME on request, a, a certificate on request, it will not be accepted by DOH at the time of license renewal. This is their new rule. So please, um, you can go on TAM anytime, click on the lecture topic and apply for that CME. We will approve it as soon as possible and you will get your certificate from the DOH website from TAM. Uh, so if there's any other confusion, uh, Anit and, and Tahira will be posting an email for academic affairs in the chat box as well. So you can, um, you know, you can be in touch with us if you're still having any problems getting that CME from the OH. Um, and then, um, yeah, during the CME, please keep yourself on mute, enjoy the session. And towards the end, we have kept 15 minutes for any discussion, any questions that you might have. So as you think of them, please putting, keep putting them down on the chat box and one of us will be looking at them. And Dr. Hala will be more than happy to address those questions and share her knowledge and experience with you. Uh, so we'll just wait for two to three minutes more. And at 8.30, we will start with Dr. Hala's session on thyroid disorders. Thank you.
Good morning and welcome once again to this CME on thyroid disorders organized by United Eastern Medical Services and managed by health, um, including Health Plus Clinics, Danat Al Emirat Hospital and Moorfields Eye Hospital Abu Dhabi. Uh, so we are very excited to have this uh, session on thyroid disorders because as we all know, it's a very common problem that a lot of our patients uh, you know, are going through with, irrespective of which speciality we may be in. Uh, they may have coexisting thyroid disorders. So it's very, very interesting and very, very important for us to be aware of this um, topic. And we are extremely um, lucky to have Dr. Hala here with us today, who will be talking us uh, through thyroid disorders and also will be sharing her experience and knowledge of many, many years. Dr. Hala is a consultant at the Diabetes and Endocrinology Center uh, of Health Plus in Abu Dhabi. And she has more than 15 years of experience in Lebanon earlier as well. She did her uh, medical education from American University of Beirut, Lebanon, and also holds a master's of health professional education. Uh, she has been teaching at the Beirut Arab University as well. She is a member of multiple endocrine societies and is an expert, is considered an expert in the field and has also been awarded the Alpha Omega Alpha Award for her outstanding achievements. So I welcome Dr. Hala. Uh, just before we start, Dr. Hala, a few um, more instructions for the participants. Uh, please do complete the pre-lecture, post-lecture, and evaluation form links being posted in the chat box. We have also posted the link that you can use to apply for the CME certificate through TAM, so please keep your eye on that. And the last thing is that please do stay throughout the session so that you have at least attended majority of the session for us to be able to apply for your CME certificate. Thank you and enjoy the session. Over to you, Dr. Hala. Everyone, thank you, Dr. Niha, for the kind introduction. And thank you all for joining us to talk about a very interesting topic, which is thyroid disorders. Uh, the outline of the presentation, I will try to identify the commonly encountered thyroid function disorders. We will tackle the clinical manifestation, the pathophysiology, diagnosis and management of thyroid disorders, and we'll be also interpreting thyroid function tests. To start with, let's start with the basic. So the thyroid gland is a bilobed gland with an isthmus in between located in our neck area and weighs around 15 to 25 grams. Its functional histological unit is the thyroid follicle responsible for the production of the thyroid hormones. So normally, the thyroid gland is being stimulated by the pituitary gland which secretes thyroid stimulating hormone, which in turn is being stimulated by the thyroid releasing hormone secreted by the hypothalamus, in turn for the thyroid gland to secrete the thyroid hormones T4 and T3. The thyroid gland secretes the majority of its hormone T4, which undergoes mostly peripheral conversion to T3 in peripheral tissues. Now the T4 and the T3 exerts a negative feed path on the pituitary gland and on the hypothalamus to inhibit the production of the TSH and the TRH. Now, when we go and talk about hypothyroidism, actually it's a multi-system disorder that's basically caused because of the lack of thyroid hormones in the body tissues. And very rarely it may be caused by resistance to the action of thyroid hormones in the body tissue. The prevalence of hypothyroidism is looked at in different countries. Actually, a meta-analysis looking at nine European countries found that the prevalence of overt and subclinical hypothyroidism is around 5%. It's clear that hypothyroidism occurs more often in women and in elderly above 65 years. It's very common in individuals who at baseline have other autoimmune diseases such as type 1 diabetes, celiac disease, and others. Individuals with Down syndrome or Turner syndrome are at increased risk of developing hypothyroidism. And for some reason, smoking and moderate alcohol intake were found to be associated with a lower risk. Uh, the causes of hypothyroidism are really many. We usually classify them into primary, secondary or tertiary and peripheral. The primary is the far most common cause of hypothyroidism and it's mostly a problem that exists within the thyroid gland itself. The most common primary cause is Hashimoto thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune disease, which we'll talk about it in a while. 
Worldwide, the most prevalent cause of primary hypothyroidism is iodine deficiency. Other primary causes include surgery, radiation, and certain medications that may affect the thyroid gland. The secondary causes of hypothyroidism are far less common compared to the primary causes. And here the problem actually exists either at the level of the pituitary gland, in that case we say it's secondary hypothyroidism, or at the level of the hypothalamus, and in that case we say it's tertiary hypothyroidism. The most common secondary causes are either tumors at the level of the pituitary, trauma, certain infections, infiltrative disorders, and certain medications that may act at the level of the pituitary and the hypothalamus, such as steroids. Now, there is a very rare cause of hypothyroidism, and it's called the consumptive hypothyroidism, often found in massive infantile hemangiomas. Hashimoto is by far the most common cause of hypothyroidism in the United States. Basically, in this entity, we have an autoimmune disorder with an autoimmune destruction of the thyroid glands. Thus, in 90 to 95% of these individuals, if we measure the thyroid peroxidase antibody, it would be actually positive. In the beginning, in those individuals, we will find a goiter, but with time, with the destruction happening, very little thyroid tissue would remain. This entity is rarely associated with pain, and the hypothyroidism is of gradual onset, and it progresses slowly. The hypothyroidism, when it is there, it causes different clinical manifestations. I, I would like to share the study that basically showed that the clinical manifestation would really vary depending if the hypothyroidism is happening in a young or an elderly individual. In younger individuals, the most common symptoms are fatigue, feeling weak most of the time, having cold intolerance, depression in certain instances, weight gain, uh, muscle cramps, and other symptoms. In the elderly, we find some of the atypical symptoms such as anorexia and weight loss. And mostly elderly have more atypical symptoms when compared to younger individuals. That's why the suspicion for hypothyroidism should be higher in elderly, especially when they develop some of the atypical symptoms and we should screen for it in those individuals. So, the untreated hypothyroidism was found to contribute to hypertension, to high cholesterol, to infertility in certain instances, and to cognitive impairment and neuromuscular dysfunction in some cases. The women who have hypothyroidism may also present with irregularities in the menstrual cycle, and in certain situations, they may, they may present with infertility. In elderly, we find cognitive decline sometimes as the only manifestation of hypothyroidism. Now that we know what hypothyroidism and its causes are, let's look at the management. So far, levothyroxine or LT4 is the standard of care of treatment of hypothyroidism. It's a very efficacious treatment. It's given orally. It has a long half-life. And in the majority of the individuals, it leads to the resolution of the signs and the symptoms. The rationale for its use lies in the peripheral conversion of T4 to its active metabolite, which is the T3 hormone, which is the active thyroid hormone. And this mostly happens in peripheral tissues by the type 1 and the type 2 deiodinase enzymes. T3 acts on different body systems and different tissues in the body. It contributes to the ionotropic and chronotropic effect on the heart, increasing the cardiac output. It contributes to the systemic vascular resistance. So basically, the T3 is the active hormone that contributes to the function of the thyroid hormones at the different parts of the body tissues and organs. Now, how do we decide on the dose for the thyroid hormone? We really have to take different factors into account including the weight of the patient, including whether the patient is a pregnant lady or not, the etiology of the hypothyroidism, how high the TSH is, whether the patient is elderly or not, whether they have cardiac diseases or not, and the serum thyrotropin goal, which is appropriate, that is needed for every single individual should also be considered when choosing the dose of the thyroid hormone. It's important to note 
that the co-administration of food will affect the absorption of the levothyroxine. That's why we often advise patients to take the thyroid hormone 30 to 60 minutes before breakfast, and if they miss that, to take it at bedtime three hours after the last evening meal. And levothyroxine should be preferably to be separated from other medications that may interfere with its absorption, such as calcium carbonate and ferrous sulfate. And there are some other medications like aluminum hydroxide and sucralfate that may have also effect on its absorption, but it was not sufficiently studied. What about the T3, T4 combination? Again, based on a very strong recommendation, uh, the thyroid replacement hormone is levothyroxine, which is LT4, and evidence does not really support the use of LT3 and LT4 combination. I would like to point out that there was a small study that evaluated the use of LT3 in patients who have depression and found some minimal improvement. But again, the mainstay of therapy is levothyroxine. And the reason for that is that the T4 has a long half-life. It's very stable and long acting, and there is a very good intestinal absorption of it. And anyway, it will undergo peripheral conversion to T3, which is the active hormone. The problem with the T3 is that it has a very short half-life. The onset of action is usually two to four hours. It's very rapidly absorbed and it causes a lot of blood level fluctuations. So usually we prefer in a non-pregnant adult patients to give a dose of 1.6 micra per kilogram per day. However, in elderly or patients with cardiac disease, we have to be more cautious and there is no harm in starting with a lower dose, like a 25 to 50 micra per day. And we can increase subsequently every three to four weeks by 25 microgram until we reach the full replacement dose, which is required. There are certain situations where it would be required to either increase the dose requirement or to decrease it. Sometimes we need a higher LT4 dose, especially in individuals whom we know they have a problem with intestinal absorption, such as individuals who have H. pylori infection, malabsorption, have underwent bariatric surgery. Also in some individuals, T4 requirement would increase and hence the dose should be increased as well such as, for instance, in pregnancy and with weight gain. And there are certain medications that are known to increase the metabolic clearance of T4, especially some anti-epileptic drugs. And in that case, we need to consider this and we need to give higher dose in order to satisfy the body's needs. On the other hand, there are certain situations where we need to actually decrease the dose because the requirements are going to be much less, especially in elderly especially in individuals who have cardiac disease, especially in individuals who are on androgens or, or who have weight loss. We talked about hypothyroidism and we mentioned that there is a primary hypothyroidism, which is the most common cause. And we said that the secondary or the central hypothyroidism is far less common. What is central hypothyroidism? So basically we do have decreased thyroid hormone production but the problem is basically because of insufficient stimulation of the thyroid gland by the pituitary or by the hypothalamus. If it's a problem in pituitary TSH release, we say it's secondary hypothyroidism. If the problem is in hypothalamic TRH release, we say it's tertiary hypothyroidism. If we check the labs in these individuals, we will find that they have a low T4, a low T3, with the TSH being either low or inappropriately normal. How should we suspect central hypothyroidism? We should suspect it in anyone who has a hypothalamic or a pituitary disease or a mass lesion in the pituitary. And the goal here is, of course, to give them again the thyroid hormone replacement. However, we don't follow the TSH as a way of monitoring these individuals for being appropriately treated. Rather, we aim that we have a 3 t 4 3 t 3 in the mid-upper normal range. This is our target for these individuals. Now, there is an entity which is called the non-thyroid illness, or you may see it in books as sick euthyroid syndrome or the low T3 syndrome. 
We often find this entity in, in individuals who are hospitalized. Usually they are in critical care units. And when you measure the thyroid test for those individuals, you will find that they either have low or low normal T4. They will have a low T3 with a low or low normal or normal TSH, mimicking the central hypothyroidism. And these individuals is a kind of a protective mechanism that the body adopts in such a situation of critical illness. And we usually do not treat those patients with thyroid hormones. And we recommend for those individuals in critical care unit to have a repeat of their thyroid test, typically in one to two weeks, to, because later on they would have recovery of the thyroid function without the need for treatment. And you, usually such a situation happens as a kind of physiological adaptation to their critical care illness that they're passing through. I would like to talk about mixed edema coma. I, I'm sure you've heard of it. It's an extreme form of hypothyroidism. It's not common, it's exceedingly rare. These individuals will have the severe symptoms of hypothyroidism. Usually their mental status would be affected. You may find that they have a low body temperature. They will have a hypercapnia. And these individuals uh, are, are usually uh, like the precipitating factor for such a condition is either infection, a cardiac event, a trauma, exposure to the cold weather, being not treated for a very long time. And physically, we find that they usually have a mixed edematous phase, generalized puffiness all over the body. They will have an enlarged tongue. They will have very dry skin. And on labs, we typically find the low sodium level. The glucose will be low in certain situations. They will have anemia and high cholesterol. Since it's a very severe form of hypothyroidism and since usually the mental status is affected, the management should include like a large initial dose of T4, preferably given in the intravenously because the absorption would be affected because of the diffuse edema that happens in the GI tract. So usually we give a high dose of IV T4. Sometimes we may add T3 as well. In these individuals, usually they do have also low cortisol levels, so we give them IV hydrocortisone, and we have to give them symptomatic therapy. Like if they need oxygen, we may give them oxygen. We give them usually blankets to warm those individuals. We do fluid restriction to, as a way of treatment for the hyponatremia. And of course, we identify what's the precipitating event, and we usually try to tackle that as well. Subclinical hypothyroidism is an entity where the TSH is high. However, the T4 and T3 are usually normal. So it's only an increase in the TSH. It usually affects up to 10% of the adult population. Again, the most common cause of this entity, just like in primary hypothyroidism, it's Hashimoto thyroiditis. These individuals have a high tendency of going from subclinical to the overt hypothyroidism. And if we measure the thyroid peroxidase antibody and it's positive, this means that they are at high tendency of developing overt hypothyroidism. There are some studies that showed that even if it is subclinical and the individual uh, has only TSH elevation, they may be at increased risk of uh, cardiac events, heart rate, and a slight increased risk of mortality from heart disease. And elderly especially, they may have some cognitive impairment with a subclinical hypothyroidism. So given that subclinical hypothyroidism exists in 10% of adults, it's important to know what to do about it. So basically the first thing to be done is basically to repeat the thyroid test and to confirm that subclinical hypothyroidism really exists. With regards to the treatment, it really depends whether we're dealing with a young or an, on an elderly individual. Usually for all individuals, if the TSH reach the point of 10 or above, even if the 3T4 and the T3 are normal, we, the evidence showed that it's better to treat those individuals with LT4 to decrease the risk of progression to overt hypothyroidism and to decrease the risk of having cardiac events or heart failure. For individuals who have a level between 7 and 
We may consider treatment in elderly above 65, may consider treatment depending on the situation. However, it's better to treat the young individuals to decrease the risk of fatal stroke or cardiovascular mortality for those individuals who are less than 65. Treatment is not recommended if the TSH is between 4.5 to 6.9 in individuals above the age of 65. However, for individuals who are less than 65 years, we usually measure the antibodies, and if it is positive, we consider treatment. Again, treatment is recommended in all cases if TSH above 10, and depending on the age, we may consider or not treatment depending on the thyroperoxidase antibody status and depending on the age of the patient. Now, I would like to tackle a little bit thyroid disease and pregnancy. So there are some physiological changes that happen in the thyroid function during pregnancy. It's well known that during pregnancy, we have an increase in renal iodide clearance. Okay, that's why the iodine intake requirement in pregnant women is higher. And also in the first trimester of pregnancy, the pregnant women secrete a lot of HCG. And this, the pregnancy hormone actually looks very similar to the TSH hormone. And that's why the, in the first trimester, because of the HCG effect on the thyroid, acting like the thyroid the stimulating hormone, we often find increase in the thyroid hormone production. And that's why if we measure the TSH in the blood, we will find that it is lower than in the normal adult range. In addition, in pregnancy, if we look at the total T4, we find that it is higher because we have increase in the thyroxine binding globulin during pregnancy. And that's why the total T4 is 1.5 times the upper range for the non-pregnant woman. Adding to that, there are some assay issues, especially in the pre T4 during the pregnancy. Taking all this into consideration, there have been guidelines on how to interpret thyroid tests during the pregnancy. Now, if we look at the guidelines before 2016 versus the ATA guidelines in 2017, they all considered that the TSH range should be a little bit dropped down during the pregnancy. For example, before the 2016 guidelines, they stated that the first trimester TSH should be less than 2.5. However, when we go on to the second and third trimester, it would be less than three. On the other hand, if we look at the ATA guidelines in 2017, they would say that if we have a population specific studies done, and we do have a trimester specific ranges for a specific country, it's better to adopt that However, if this is not available or not feasible, then you can do like a rough estimation, reduce the upper limit of TSH by 0.5 uh, and reduce the lower limit by 0.4. For instance, if the normal range of the TSH is 0.5 to 4.5, then you can reduce the upper limit by 0.5 and the lower limit by 0.4. And this is a good way of estimating what's a normal TSH range for pregnant women. However, in the second and the third trimester, we can return back to the non-pregnant reference range. Regarding the guidelines, what do they state about treatment of hypothyroidism in pregnancy? Again, T4 is the one recommended and not T3. We should monitor the serum TSH every four weeks until we reach mid gestation, and then at least once after 30 weeks of gestation. And we should target around a TSH in the lower half of the trimester specific range or below 2.5. So this is what we aim for during pregnancy. Now with regards to the overt hypothyroidism, no debate, Treat all individuals aim for a TSH less than 2.5. However, subclinical hypothyroidism in pregnancy, usually all pregnant women who have a TSH above 2.5, first step, do a thyroid peroxidase antibody and test for it. Definite recommendation for LT4 treatment in subclinical hypothyroidism in anyone who have a TSH 
above the pregnancy specific reference range and the positive antibodies. So TSH high with a positive antibody bleed anyway. TSH above 10 without a positive antibody, you also need to treat anyway. So all pregnant women who have overt hypothyroidism need to be treated. If they have a subclinical hypothyroidism with TSH above 10, again, treat. If they have a subclinical hypothyroidism with a positive antibody, again, treat them with levothyroxine. You may consider levothyroxine therapy based on the ATA guidelines. If you have a TSH more than 2.5, only with a positive antibodies. Otherwise, with a TSH above 10, we would consider treatment anyway. Levothyroxine therapy is not recommended if the woman have a TPO negative uh, status with a normal TSH. And if you have isolated low free T4 with no problem of TSH, again, it's not routinely to be treated. There is insufficient evidence so far to determine if LT4 treatment will decrease pregnancy risk loss in patients who have only positive antibody status. So if the patient is euthyroid and the TFTs are normal and only they have a positive antibody, studies have not shown that T4 does decrease the pregnancy loss. However, if the patient have a recurrent pregnancy loss and their antibody is positive, there is a weak recommendation that stay that we can actually give a very low dose of LT4 around 25 to 50 microgram. So we may consider it in patient with recurrent pregnancy loss if they have positive antibodies. Before the woman become pregnant, we should really educate and counsel about the risk of hypothyroidism, about the importance of doing the monthly thyroid function test, about the may, that they may need an increase in the thyroid hormone replacement during pregnancy, and in some studies, it states that it's better to increase the dose anyway as soon as they are found pregnant by 20 to 30 percent. Uh, but this is basically based on small studies. After they deliver, we usually return the thyroid hormone dose to the dose they were at before pregnancy. And it's better to do a thyroid function test six weeks after delivery just to check on their thyroid status. So now that we tackled hypothyroidism, whether overt or subclinical or during pregnancy, let's move on to the other side, which is the hyperthyroidism. So to define hyperthyroidism, it's basically a state where we have the opposite now. We have increase in the thyroid hormone production, and this could be due to an endogenous increase or because of exogenous or overtreatment by thyroid hormone. The thyrotoxicosis term is used to demonstrate the clinical manifestation that appear because of this excess thyroid hormone production. Clinically, these individuals may have weight loss, unexplained weight loss. They may have heat intolerance. They may have excessive sweating, feeling that their skin is often warm and moist. They may have certain ophthalmopathy. This is usually associated with Graves' disease. You may notice that they may have a goiter, they may have tachycardia, increased shortness of breath, the stool frequency may be increased, and females, again, may have menstrual irregularity. They may have increased anxiety and irritability and nervousness. The problem with the hyperthyroidism is that we have increased ionotropic and increased chronotropic effect. So especially in elderly, we should be very cautious because this may precipitate a cardiac event. And also the cardiac output will increase in these individuals between 50 and 300%, which increases the risk for high output heart failure. When we want to talk about the causes of um, hyperthyroidism, again, we can classify it as primary or secondary. So the primary is basically a problem within the thyroid gland itself. The most common primary hyperthyroidism cause is Graves' disease, where basically, again, it's an autoimmune disease where the body has increased in the thyroid stimulating hormone receptor stimulating antibody, which basically stimulates the TSH receptor continuously. 
Uh, other causes for primary hyperthyroidism are toxic multinodular goiter and toxic uh, hot nodule. And there are also the thyroiditis that increase the risk of uh, primary hyperthyroidism. The secondary hyperthyroidism is basically a problem that happens at the level of the pituitary or tertiary hyperthyroidism at the level of the hypothalamus, where we basically have increased the SH, and this will stimulate the thyroid gland to produce more thyroid hormone. If we want to interpret the thyroid test in hyperthyroidism, we often find the TSH to be low and the T4 and the T3 to be high. There's an entity called the T3 thyrotoxicosis, where we find it more common in Graves disease, where you find the T4 to be normal, the T3 to be high, and the TSH to be suppressed. Subclinical hyperthyroidism is an entity where the TSH is low, but the T4 and the T3 are totally normal. And if we have a secondary cause for the hyperthyroidism, which is very, very rare, such as the TSH secreting pituitary adenoma, we will find the TSH to be either normal or high along with a high T4 and a high T3. So the, if the TSH is normal with a high T4 and a high T3, we consider this to be inappropriately normal and we should investigate for a secondary cause for hyperthyroidism. Again, Graves' disease is the most common cause of hyperthyroidism. To note that the toxic multinodular goiter may become the most common cause in elderly individuals, especially in areas with iodine deficiency. So back to Graves' disease, is an autoimmune disease. We have a TSH receptor stimulating antibody, continuously stimulating the TSH receptor and making the thyroid to increase its thyroid hormone production. It's actually responsible for 60 to 80% of the cases of hyperthyroidism and, not, and like all thyroid disorders, uh, they are far more common in women, whether hypo or hyper. Risk factors for Graves' disease include the gender females are more likely to have, the age, usually we find the Graves in young individuals, younger than 40. Having other autoimmune disease will increase the risk for Graves' disease. There are studies that, saw, that showed that stress is a trigger, Pregnancy or a recent childbirth may increase the risk for this disorder. And smoking, which may have an impact on the immune system, may increase the risk of Graves' disease. However, uh, and also smokers, if they have Graves' disease, they are at more risk of developing Graves' ophthalmopathy. Graves' ophthalmopathy in an, is an entity that we often find in patients who have Graves' disease where basically the same TSH stimulating antibody may attack the periorbital muscles and may lead to extraocular muscles, inflammation, edema, and this may lead to proptosis, irritation of the conjunctiva, and periorbital edema. How do we diagnose Graves' disease? So basically the TSH will be suppressed. The T4 and the T3 will be high, especially the T3 will T3 to T4 ratio is going to be high. We, if we look for the thyroid stimulating uh, TSH uh, receptor antibody, the TRAB, it will be high. And if we do the scintigraphy, either the radio iodine uptake or the, per tech, or the technetium scan, we will find a diffuse uptake uh, of the uh, radio iodine or of the technetium scan in patients who have a Graves' disease. Toxic multinodular goiter is when we have at least two hot nodules or at least two autonomously functioning nodules. Again, on the technetium scan, we will find these hot nodules. And there is the toxic single nodule where we have only one nodule, which is hot, which suppresses the activity of the remainder of the thyroid gland. There is a hyperthyroidism. It's not very common, but it's due to thyroiditis. And here I'll be talking about two entities, the subacute thyroiditis and the painless or silent thyroiditis. The subacute thyroiditis is often called the painful thyroiditis. You will often find these individuals have a history of a viral infection before that. And usually the thyroid gland will be tender to touch. It will be enlarged two to three times. They may have associated symptoms like fever, fatigue, chills. It's most commonly caused by certain viral infections, such as mumps, influenza, adenoviruses, mostly occurring in women. 
And usually the way of treatment is by giving them a pain and sales to decrease the inflammation. And in some cases, we may resort to steroids and take to, to treat this antibiotic. Postpartum thyroiditis, also called the painless thyroiditis, as the term identifies, we often find it in women after delivery. The thyroid is not tender to touch, and usually they have a three phases. They will pass it through a three phase. First, they will have the hyperthyroid phase, which lasts for a while. Then they may become a euthyroid, and then they may go into the hypothyroidism stage. Those who go to the hypothyroidism stage usually have Hashimoto on top of that. They have positive thyroid peroxidase antibodies. And the silent hyperthyroid stage is usually no treatment is needed. Once they go to the hypothyroid stage, then of course we need to give uh, LT4 replacement. And as the figure shows, they will pass it through the hyperthyroid, then the hypothyroid stage eventually in some individuals. In others, they will become new thyroid. To determine what's the cause of hyperthyroidism, so basically, if we measure the TRAB antibody, it will help us because if it is high, it suggests a Graves' disease. And doing the thyroid technetium scan or the radioiodine uptake would really help us because if there is a diffuse uptake, we will, it will suggest a Graves' disease. If we have a single hot nodule, it will suggest a toxic adenoma. And if we have a decreased uptake, it will suggest a thyroiditis or exogenous thyroid hormone replacement. How do we treat hyperthyroidism? So it's important to manage them to do a symptomatic treatment. We usually give them beta blockers for all individuals who have heart rate uh, increase. If their resting heart rate is more than 90 beats per minute, or if they have a coexisting cardiovascular disease. And uh, usually in Graves' disease, we usually tell, discuss, we do extensive discussion with the patient. We actually counsel them about their entity. We tell them about the options of therapy in this case, which is antithyroid drugs. They may resort to surgery, do thyroidectomy or radioiodine therapy. To decide on which we should choose, we should really explain to the patient the benefits and the risks of each one of them. For instance, individuals who are planning pregnancy within the coming six months, then radioiodine therapy is not an option. For individuals who have an active graves of thalmopathy, again, we will not resort to radioiodine therapy. We should explain exactly the benefits and risks of each one of them, and then the patient may elect to choose one over another. Now, in case we elected to go for the radioiodine therapy, usually we give a dose of around 10 to 15 millipuri. And if the patient is planning radioiodine and she's a female, we need to do the pregnancy test within 48 hours, especially in women in the childbearing potential. And after the radioiodine therapy, usually we continue to follow them up like every four weeks to make sure that they become new thyroid, and if they become hypothyroid, we need to treat that as well. For patients who choose the antithyroid therapy, so basically methimazole is chosen in every single patient, except during the first trimester of pregnancy when we choose PTU, because methimazole is teratogenic and associated with aplasia cutis. Also in thyroid storm, we elect to go for PTU instead of methimazole. And in patients who are allergic to methimazole, we may resort for PTU. Otherwise, for all other patients, methimazole is the indicated treatment. All patients should be informed of the side effects of antithyroid treatment and the importance of consulting their physician in case they develop pruritic rash, jaundice, any darkness in the urine, fever, sore throat. So they need to inform the doctor about that. Uh, liver function and hepatocellular integrity, it's better to be assessed before we start the treatment. And also if they develop any of the pruritic rash, jaundice, joint pain, uh, because there is a risk of agranulocytosis, so we need to elect the patients to stop treatment if they developed any fever or pharyngitis. Currently, there is no sufficient information to recommend 
that we should do a routine liver function test as a follow-up for patients who are already on antiviral therapy. Although it is indicated to be done before starting it, but no real recommendation to do monthly or follow-up of, of liver tests. If we chose the surgery for those patients, then the patients should be rendered euthyroid before starting the, before going on to the surgery, they should be biochemically euthyroid. So we will elect to treat them with antithyroid treatment until they're euthyroid. And sometimes we may elect to give them beta blockers before the surgery. If the surgery is chosen, it's better to go for near total or total thyroidectomy. And as soon as we will, the surgery is planned, the antithyroid treatment should be stopped. Now, as a general information, if the patient is hyperthyroid, when can we do the surgery and any kind of the surgery? Uh, like if they were planning to do a cholecystectomy or appendectomy or whatever. So patients with subclinical hyperthyroidism who are asymptomatic, who have a normal 3T4 may proceed to surgery. But patients who are overt hyperthyroid all elective surgeries are better to be postponed because of the increased risk of hyperthyroidism that they may have while they're um, during anesthesia or while during surgery. And these are the references for today's talks. And I'd be happy to share any of the references if anyone wants them. Thank you very much for your attention today. If you have questions, you're more than welcome to ask. Thank you so much, Dr. Hala. That was really uh, very interesting and uh, very, very comprehensive. Um, in fact, we have a comment from Dr. Huda that it was an excellent coverage. Thank you, uh, Dr. Huda. With a good description of the thyroid uh, functions this, um, in tests. Uh, there are a few questions already posted, and I would request anybody else who have, has any questions, either you can post them in the chat box or you can raise your hand and we can ask you to ask Dr. Hala directly. Meanwhile, the questions that are already here, from Dr. Samina, she wants to know Hashimoto's thyroiditis primar primarily consists of anti-TPO antibodies, but what if multiple antibodies are positive? So usually for Hashimoto thyroiditis, uh, the anti-TPO antibodies may be elevated or the antithyroglobulin may be elevated. Having a positive any anti-thyroid antibody along with having hypothyroidism will make us think that Hashimoto thyroiditis is the high likely cause. I'm not sure if this is the question, uh, Dr. Samina, if you are there and you'd like to ask uh, directly. Okay, we'll wait for her to respond if she has any further clarifications on that. Uh, meanwhile, another question from uh, Karuna Ratne. Should you routinely request anti-TPO antibodies along with TSH and TFT4 on initial suspicion of thyroid illness or only after seeing an abnormality on blood tests? And is there Very any good question? Let's do that first, then more questions from you. Yeah. So basically, if there is any suspicion for any kind of thyroid disease, the first thing we actually order is the TSH level. If the TSH level is abnormal, then we would elect to do the T3 and the T4. And if it is, there is suspicion for, uh, suspicion for hypothyroidism, then the anti-TPO and the anti-thyroglobin and antibodies be requested. So usually we don't do them all together right from the beginning. There is no real need to do so. If there is a very high suspicion of thyroid disease, start with a TSH. Okay. The next part of the question is, is there any indication for repeat testing of anti-TPO antibodies periodically? Yeah, so basically, no, not, not needed. Usually the anti-TPO antibody is basically to diagnose the patients as uh, what's the cause for their hypothyroidism. However, in certain cases, we may elect to repeat it to find out if it's really increasing or dropping down. However, the mainstay of therapy anyway is LT4 therapy. And basically the best thing to monitor is basically the thyroid test to make sure that the patient is well replaced. Okay, and they also want to know, uh, when is it useful to ask for T3 levels specifically? So basically, uh, whenever we have a TSH, which is abnormal, it's better to check for the T4 and the T3 levels. For example, in T3 thyrotoxicosis, we have an isolated high T3 with a low TSH with a normal T4. So yes, whenever the TSH is abnormal, it's better to check for the T4 and the T3 levels. Okay, great. 
so Dr. Samina has gotten back to me. Uh, she's asking that having multiple antibodies, does it affect management? Is the treatment more aggressive? Well, actually, it's not because the antibodies level were not really correlated with uh, how severe the hypothyroidism. Like some patients have mild increase in the antibodies and yet their TSH is so high. Other individuals, they would have a very high antibodies and yet their TFT is within the normal range. Okay. Is that the question? I think so. I think that should answer her questions. Uh, if, Samina, if you have any other, uh, anything you want to ask, you can post it here. I know, I think she's satisfied. She's posted a thanks. Uh, another question from Christian is the precipitance of myxedema crisis in a hypothyroid patient are usually non-thyroidal illnesses. So when do we do the thyroid function test for suspected myxedema crisis in a previously undiagnosed hypothyroid patient? Since you said we should wait for one to four weeks because of sick euthyroid syndrome. So it's a long question. Yeah, again, it's a very good question. Basically, in sick euthyroid patients, patients are already critically ill. They don't really have the typical symptoms of hypothyroidism. But for some reason, the thyroid tests were ordered and they were found to have a low to normal TSH, low T4, low T3, with a high reverse T3, and it's a kind of a physiological adaptation. With a mixed edema coma, on the other hand, the patient usually comes with a typical severe form of hypothyroidism with its clinical manifestations. So they would, uh, re would really have high suspicion because they would have like, for example, hypothermia, bradycardia, uh, you will find that they have hyponatremia. You will find that they have extreme puffiness in their face. So there will be high clinical suspicion for myxedema coma, and then we will test for it. So basically with myxedema coma, we have the typical severe form of clinical manifestation of hypothyroidism, and we should immediately test for it and immediately treat it. In reality, myxedema coma was found to happen more often in individuals who are established to be hypothyroid, but either they have not been taking the therapy properly or they have other issues such as malabsorption. So usually they do have already the history of hypothyroidism prior to that. Whereas in sick thyroid syndrome are individuals who had no thyroid disease whatsoever. You just did the thyroid test by like uh, suddenly and you find them to be really abnormal. So I'm not sure if this answered Dr. Christian's question. Yes, I, I think so. If any further queries, and uh, they can post in the chat box. There is another question from SS. Um, uh, thanks, Dr. Hala. Very informative talk. The slide on treatment of hypothyroidism, non-pregnant patient dose is 1.6 microgram per kg per day. So for a 65 kg adult, uh, what would you be the initiation dose and how many times per day should it be given? Would you be able to calculate that? Yeah, so the thyroxine treatment is, uh, it has a very long half-life. It's given just once a day. It's one tablet a day, usually preferably in the morning, 30 minutes to 60 minutes before uh, breakfast or three hours after the evening meal if they miss that. And usually for the dose, it's around 1.6 micra per kilo per day. So you just do the calculation depending on the weight. Usually myself, I would really uh, take that dose and give a little bit less and then follow up the TFT in like four to six weeks. And depending on the thyroid test, then I would really adjust the dose accordingly. For the elderly or patients with cardiac disease, we have to be cautious. It's better to start with a low dose, not the 1.6 micra per kilo per day dose. Usually I elect to start 25 to 50. And this is actually what the studies have shown, that it's better to start low, monitor the TFT every four to six weeks and adjust the thyroid hormone treatment accordingly. If it's a very young individual with a very high TSH, yes, go for the 1.6 micra per kilo per day and don't even think about it. So basically it depends on how high the TSH, how symptomatic is the patient, whether they're young or elderly, whether they have cardiac disease or not. It really depends on all of these factors when you decide on the right dose to start. Okay, perfect. And I think the key there is from your experience is to start with a slightly lower dose and then adjust in four to six weeks, right? So yeah, especially, yeah. especially high risk group. So thank you so much. And I, uh, Christian is satisfied with the, with the answer also for the previous answer. Dr. Iftihaj has uh, written perfectly comprehensive presentation and she wants, she has also a question. If young patient has high antibody level and also has symptoms suggestive of hypothyroidism, but TSH is normal, 
what is your recommendation? What do you do in such cases? Yeah, so this is basically autoimmune thyroiditis isolated with a normal thyroid function test. Honestly, the thyroid, the, the symptoms of the thyroid abnormalities, they mimic a lot of uh, other diseases. For example, they mimic depression, they may mimic anxiety, they may mimic other causes. If you want to go by what guidelines state, if the thyroid function tests are within the normal, even if the antibodies are so high, if, it's, if she's not pregnant, I wouldn't see it. Definitely, they need to have a periodic thyroid function test monitoring just to make sure whether they would become hypothyroid later on. As I mentioned, there's only a very small study that investigated whether we should treat symptomatic, especially individuals with depression, with LT3, and it showed mild improvement in the symptoms. However, it's not like highly recommended or not like within the guidelines clearly stated that we should treat those individuals. I wouldn't treat. Okay, perfect. And she has another question about the role of selenium in Hashimoto's disease. Yeah, so regarding selenium supplementation for Hashimoto thyroiditis, there have been so many studies about it, some done during pregnancy and some not. So basically what studies have shown is that the selenium supplementation is not uh, that great medicine to really decrease the antibodies. However, in pregnant women, there are some studies such as this that suggested that it de really decreases the risk of developing hypothyroidism. So there is no real harm in giving it. But like with my experience, I've given it to some patients and I've never seen the antibodies drop down. Uh, about the decreased risk of progression to hypothyroidism studies were not fully supportive of that. Okay. Dr. Iftihaj wants to clarify that the patient with the high antibody level and symptoms of hypothyroidism and the TSH is like a little bit high, six, seven. Okay, in that case, yes, I would treat. Yeah, okay. if the TSH is above normal, T six or seven is in the hypothyroid range. With positive antibodies, I would definitely treat. Maybe not give the 1.6 micra per kilo per day. I would start less than that and follow it up, but definitely needs to be treated because the TSH is above the normal range. She's oh. already a hypothyroid. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. A question from Dr. Sumi Thomas is, thank you for the great presentation. Does the high estradiol level during ovarian stimulation for IVF and frozen embryo transfer affect the thyroid levels? And also does the HCG trigger affect the levels? Supposing yeah, the so, Yeah, so estrogen replacement, yes, does affect the thyroid hormone. And as I've uh, already posted on the table, sometimes we need to adjust the thyroid hormone dose. One of the reasons why we may increase requirements is because of estrogen use. Regarding the SCG trigger, of course, it has an effect because SCG actually mimics the TSH. So basically, it acts just like it. So in the first trimester of pregnancy, we often find the TSH on the low range because of the SCG effect, because basically the SCG will stimulate the thyroid gland to produce more thyroid hormones. And this by itself will have a negative suppressive effect on TSH. Is that the question? Yes, I think they just want, she just wants to know what, what impact or if any impact is there. Um, because I yeah, think there is, both of them have an impact on the thyroid. So if we do test a TSH for a lady who's pregnant soon after the HCG trigger, then I think we should take that into consideration. And yeah, definitely. Sure repeat in four weeks, if there are no clinical symptoms, if there's no overt hypothyroidism, no previous history of thyroid disorders, then right. I think we can wait four to six weeks. And anyways, that's still within her first trimester. So if we check again at maybe eight weeks or so of pregnancy, we still have time to correct it if it's persistent. So basically any woman with a history of thyroid disease or suspicion for thyroid disease, it's very important to check for the thyroid function test during pregnancy because uh, we don't want to miss hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism during pregnancy. So especially any woman with already a history of thyroid disease needs to have a periodic monthly thyroid function test during pregnancy until week 30 and probably once afterwards. I had a question on that. Uh, once a patient who's been diagnosed with hypothyroidism for the first time in early pregnancy, only because her TSH was borderline high and her antibodies came back positive, once they are delivered, should we ask them to stop and then see you at six weeks or should we ask them to continue the medicine and then see you at six weeks? What is your recommendation? So there is, uh, there is sometimes a transient thyroid abnormalities that occur only during pregnancy, but given that she have a positive antibodies, I wouldn't stop treatment after delivery, but I would do periodic TFT testing after delivery and probably try to decrease the dose and stop it. 
If she's doing okay, then perfect. If not, she has to stay on the medicine. Patients who already have a positive antibodies are already at increased risk of hypothyroidism, regardless if they're pregnant or not. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and Dr. Martina wants to know if TSH should be taken with or without the mo morning thyroxine dose. I mean, the test, when a patient is already on medication, they come back for their follow-up. On that day, should they have taken their morning dose or skipped it? And should they have taken... Yeah, they can actually take it. There's Yeah, they can take it on the same dose as they're going to do the test. Okay. And the test need not be on a fasting uh, state. No, no, no need for it to be on fasting state. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. I think uh, that is all the questions that I have. Um, and there are a lot of comments about thanking you and appreciating your presentation. So thank you so much for that, Dr. Hala. Uh, while we are still here, um, I, and since there were so many queries about how to get the CME certificate, uh, if you don't mind, Dr. Hala, I can share my screen and I'll yeah, just like sure. walk people through how to get the certificate through TAM and DOH. Um, so I will uh, begin by uh, sharing this screen. Yes, so this is what I wanted to show all of you. Um, so we, we've done with the CME. There's still more questions. Please post them in the chat box and I'll ask Dr. Hala again. Uh, but while we are all here, I just wanted to explain how the new system works on Tham. This is an attachment that we will be sending all of you uh, in an email after the session, which gives you step-by-step -step how to apply for your certificate. Uh, this yeah, is a two-hour certificate, uh, so a double certificate, and all other participants will get a one-hour CME certificate for this session. You can log on to this website that is mentioned here in the link, and then I will show you how it... Uh, so once you log on to that link, can you see my screen, the TAM website? Yeah, so once you log on to that link that has been sent to you, you have to go to the top right-hand corner here where there are those nine dots, when you click on that, you will select DOH. So this is after logging in UA, using your UAE pass, as you normally do for you know, accessing DOH, any things. You have to um, log in to your um, uh, DOH. So from here, you have to go to Department of Health after logging in. When you go to Department of Health, this page will appear. This page will, in this page, there is a section on medical education and examination. So when you go and click on that, Oh, it's logged me out. So I will log in again with UAE Pass. And with your phone number, you can log in. You have to confirm this on your phone as you normally do. And once you do that, you will go to DOH. So the site is a bit um, basic, but but you have to go through this because Abu Dhabi DOH will not accept any other certificates now if you're licensed with Abu Dhabi. So you go to medical education and examination. And here on the top, you can see a new request. So you click on new request. And then here, you go on, you go down. You will get a request to participate to a medical education program. When you will click on this, it will then take you to the topics that you have or the sessions that you have attended. And it's all the topics that have been accredited by DOH. So you have to first complete your details, check your name, et cetera. You go to the country, phone number. And then here you have to select the program details. So you will select we have kept UEMS as the first. Yeah, so you can see all the sessions organized by UEMS are here. So for example, if you attended thyroid disorders, you could click, click on this and then select the facility. Okay, so it's not accepting submit because um, my number is not saved. But basically this is what you will do once you've completed this form, once you've selected the, uh, the session that you've attended, you will submit. Once you submit, you will get a message that your, uh, your application has been submitted. We will get a message that you have applied. And in a few days, we will sit and approve your application. As soon as it is approved, you will get a message again. And you can go and download your certificate from the same website. So that is what I wanted to show all of you. Uh, you can try it. And if there's still any issues, you can get back to us at Academic Affairs. 
Uh, but this is a new system by TAM and all of us have to follow it if the, if the CME is accredited by DOH and if we are a DOH licensed healthcare provider. So if you have any more questions on this, uh, please, uh, you can get back to us. And otherwise, uh, we will see you again next week for another CME session. So thank you so much, Dr. Hala. Thank you. And thank you, That's everyone. Fine. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day and see you next week. Bye-bye.